So today I'm gonna to talk about changes in thinking for speaking over 14 years, what further data show. Those of you who know my work know I've been following and a second language learner and changes of thinking for speaking over 14 years and I've previously published on it. But now I've looked at additional data on her in English and I'm sharing those findings with you today. So I will begin by talking about motion and motion events, typological differences between languages, what thinking for speaking is, how you can see this in descriptions of motion events between Spanish speakers and English speakers. And then I will get into the longitudinal study, what was shown before, and what further data show. Motion is a fundamental aspect of human existence. We move, we see others move, we move animate and inanimate entities. And often motion involves a change of location, movement from one place to another. And Tommy has termed this kind of movement a motion event. Motion events are composed of several components. Motion, the movement itself. Figure, the entity moving. Path, the direction the motion takes place. Ground, the object or objects in relation to which the figure moves. Manner, the way the movement is performed and cause, what brings about the movement. So languages differ in how they indicate these components lexically and syntactically. Talmi has divided the world's languages into two types based on where direction is encoded or path is encoded linguistically. One type is a verb frame language, and in verb frame languages, motion and path are indicated by the verb, and manner, if it exists in speech, is indicated by a satellite, a gerund, or a phrase. So in the expression, y sale volando, the verb sale indicates exits, path, and the gerund volando indicates flying. Now this is Spanish and Spanish is a typical verb frame language. In satellite frame languages, on the other hand, motion and manner are indicated by the verb. Path is indicated by a satellite, an adverb particle or a preposition of movement. English is a typical satellite frame language. So in the expression and flies out of the cage, the verb flies indicates motion and manner and the satellite out indicates path. Now it's important to be aware that Tommy's typology is problematic. It doesn't account for gradations between languages that might be a mixture of verb framed and satellite framed. It does not account for intratypological differences between languages which have been discovered as, you know, I'm talking with satellite framed and verb framed about intertypological, but within verb frame languages and satellite frame languages, there are also intra typological differences. And Tommy's typology does not account for serial verb languages. And Slobin has come up with the term equal polentally framed for these languages. However, in this talk, I'm gonna to stick to verb framed and satellite framed because I'm talking about Spanish and English. So what is thinking for speaking? Thinking. It's thinking that occurs online. It's the thinking that's going on in our heads in the process of speaking. And because it's going on in our heads, it's very difficult to access. How can we access 
how people are actually thinking in their heads. And this is partially what this talk is about. So in first language acquisition, Slobin has proposed that children learn a particular way of thinking for speaking. And because we learn it so early, and it is part of our first language, the language we start speaking, it is resistant to change in second language acquisition. Uh, Cardiano and Lund and I have stated that learners must learn a different pattern of thinking for speaking, or as Ro Robinson and Ellis have said, or rethink for speaking, especially when the first language and the second language are two typologically different languages. So the main question for thinking for speaking in second language acquisition is, how do patterns of thinking for speaking change as learners acquire and become proficient in a second language? So in terms of speech and gesture, the position I take on speech and gesture are that they are a single integrated co-expressive system. They represent two aspects of thought, the verbal and the imagistic. They are both affected by context, by task, by participants. They do not occur independently from the social environment or the cultural environment. They express the same meanings as well as perform the same pragmatic functions. And they develop from a growth point. And this is an important point because a growth point model is not an information processing model. It's a microgenetic model for speech and gesture production. It's Vygotsky's notion of a psychological predicate, inner speech extended to include gesture. And we can think about the growth point as a kernel or seed of thinking. And speech and gesture develop from the growth point and influence each other. And I think McNeil Eitel stated very well, it is the initial unit of thinking for speaking out of which a dynamic process of utterance level and discourse level organization emerges. Imagery and spoken form are mutually influencing. It is not that imagery is the input to spoken form or spoken form is the input to imagery. The growth point is fundamentally both. So how do we identify the growth point? We look at the synchrony of speech and the stroke of the gesture. And by finding this, we can figure out how a person is thinking for speaking. So what are some of the linguistic and gestural differences in thinking for speaking in verb framed and satellite frame languages? Speakers of verb frame languages describe states. They tend to elaborate descriptions of settings. On the other hand, uh, speakers of satellite frame languages describe processes. They tend to accumulate path components in a single clause. So they can say, John went through the door, up the stairs and into the room. And that utterance has three path components. Speakers of verb frame languages cannot do that. They need to have a new verb for each change of location. Speakers of verb frame languages tend to focus their path gestures on path verbs and have separate boundary crossing gestures. Speakers of satellite frame languages tend to focus their path gestures on satellites and accumulate path gestures within a single clause and their gestures cross boundaries. So John went through the door, 
up the stairs and into the room. And I know you didn't see my last gesture going up to the top, but it's possible to have those three gestures in one clause. Speakers of first frame languages may have manner and gesture when there is none in the accompanying speech, and they may have manner only gestures. Speakers of satellite frame languages rarely have manner and gesture when there is none in the accompanying speech, and they modify the importance of manner in speech. And they modify it in two ways. They can amplify it by having a path and manner gesture, or they can downplay it by producing a path only gesture or no gesture at all. So I'm going to show you two videos right now, one of a monolingual Spanish speaker and one of a native English speaker. And they're both describing a scene from a cartoon where Sylvester the cat um, with a bowling ball inside of him goes down the drain pipe and rolls down the street to the bowling alley. I'm going to show you the Spanish speaker first. I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. One, that his gestures are very curvilinear. And two, that at the end of the entire description, he has a separate boundary crossing gesture. Al momento de que sale, sale el gato, pero con la bola dentro ya. Y se va directamente y es de bajada y entra un bolero grande. Sí. Okay, did you see that at the end? I'm going to play it one more time for you. Al momento de que sale, sale el gato, pero con la bola dentro ya. Y se va directamente y es de bajada y entra un bolero grande. Sí. Okay. I'm now going to play you the English speaker. I want you to pay attention to a couple of things as well. One, that his gestures are very linear. And two, that he's very economical in both speech and gesture. Let's pull back down the drain pipe, goes down the street into the bowling alley strike. Okay, let me play it again as well. Falls back down the drain pipe, goes down the street into the bowling alley strike. So when I first began doing research on thinking for speaking, I was, and I observed the data and I saw where gestures were occurring, I decided that the classification just between verbs and satellites in ground noun phrases needed some adjustment because the reality is gestures do not occur with lexical affiliates. Gestures are related to concepts as the reflective of our thinking and they can occur over multiple constituents of a sentence. So the classification, the categories I came up with were verb, and I included subject and verb in that because of the differences between Spanish and English. Spanish is a pro-drop language, English is not. Satellites, I used Tommy's original uh, definition of adverb particles, but I added prepositions of path because when you're looking at gestures, you have to look at that as well. Ground noun phrase, more than one, because just as I mentioned, gestures don't always occur with one item. So more than one includes verb plus satellite, verb plus satellite plus ground noun phrase, or satellite and ground noun phrase. And then other, because path, and this is in particular in relation to path gestures. Path gestures can also occur with other items. And I came up with a larger category, other, which encompassed conjunctions, subjects alone, prepositional phrases, not of motion, adjectives, and pauses. And in 2006, 
looking at data from one cartoon episode, I compared the gestures of monolingual Spanish speakers and native English speakers. And as you can see in this chart, the majority of the Spanish speakers gestures, path gestures co-occurred with verbs and other, and the path gestures of the native English speakers were a bit more evenly distributed except for other. And the differences were between these two groups were highly significant for path gestures co-occurring with verbs. So even though some native English speakers had path gestures with verbs, the monolingual Spanish speakers had many, many more and it was highly significant. So just so you have a sense of what falls under the other category, uh, this is also data from 2006. As you can see, interestingly, the two of the uh, other gestures for the Spanish speakers occurred with subject. And I speculated that this could be due to differences in language because subjects are not required in Spanish. And if you include a noun or a pronoun subject and you have a gesture with it, you're really emphasizing who is doing the action. And it could be related to the differences in the language. Now, there have been a number of L2 thinking for speaking studies. And they have been based on elicitation of motion event descriptions, animated cartoons, picture books, video clips, and printed cartoons have been used. The participants view these items and they describe what they saw or narrate what they saw. And then comparisons are made across languages and participants. Now, it's really important when you're doing this kind of research to establish a baseline of what native speakers do. Because if you don't have that baseline, you have nothing to compare to. It's also important if you're looking at changes in a person's thinking for speaking, and you're looking to see what is developmental, what is possibly the result of transfer from the L1 to the L1, to compare the learners L1, first language, and L2, second language data. Now, the majority of studies that have compare, have looked at thinking for speaking in second language acquisition, have compared speech and writing. They examine how path, manner, and ground are expressed linguistically. And these are very, very good studies, and they give us valuable information. However, there's also a problem with them, because I have shown in previous work that appropriate verbal production of motion event descriptions alone does not guarantee that learners are using L2 thinking for speaking patterns. Their gestures really let us know if they're thinking in their L1 or thinking in their L2 or a combination of the two. So there have been several studies that have looked at speech and gesture in thinking for speaking. And these examine how path, manner, and ground are expressed linguistically and gesturally. I should mention that when we talk about path, manner, and ground gestures, we're talking about iconic representations, iconic gestures that show path, manner, and ground. So I'm going to demonstrate a few of these so you have a sense of what I mean. So this is path movement in a direction. Here's manner, climbing, and this is ground, a drain pipe. Now there have been 
differing results. And these are um, a product of different research designs. So studies that have only counted frequency of gestures have shown that L2 learners are still thinking for speaking in their L1. Studies that have looked at frequency of gestures and the interaction between speech and gesture. And I want to emphasize interaction between speech and gesture. Speech and gesture do not exist in isolation. They interact. They are part of our thinking. These studies um, show that the second language learners thinking for speaking patterns are a mixture of their L1 and L2 thinking for speaking patterns. Longitudinal studies show that L2 learners thinking for speaking patterns continue to change. And there is also evidence that just as L1 can affect L2 thinking for speaking, L2 can affect learners L1 thinking for speaking. So I'm going to talk about the longitudinal study I conducted and what the additional data adds to it. So STEM 2017 asked two questions. Does a learner's L2 thinking for speaking patterns continue, cha continue to change with regular use of the L2? And does this also affect her L1 thinking for speaking patterns? For this study, an analysis of the narration of two cartoon episodes was done. Today's talk answers the question, what do further data show about changes in a learner's L2 thinking for speaking patterns? And this talk has in it includes an analysis of narration of all eight episodes of the cartoon Canary Row. Uh, today, I'm only talking about changes in L2. I'm not addressing whether her L1 thinking for speaking patterns were affected. So I'm only looking at English. Okay, before I show you data, I want you to be aware of Oh, there's a quick question. Does it depend on the L2 proficiency for the L1 to be affected? And it was found at low intermediate level. So it doesn't have to be uh, highly proficient. I'm going to show you the, the two episodes that were analyzed for 2017 and then show you the data and what further data show just so you're familiar with the cartoon. I wish I got to party, so it's why, come on in, queen. In the wind of I wish wafter, you can hear the angels sing. When I wish hearts are happy, all the world seems bright. Help, help, the bad old pudding man is after me. Um, the participants were 
an advanced Mexican Spanish learner of English who was first videotaped in 1997. She was 29 years old at the time, and she had completed an ESOL program at an American university and was taking fundamentals of composition. She was subsequently videotaped uh, in 2006 and 2011, and the same procedures were followed for her for all videotapings. Her data were compared with that of five native English speakers and five monolingual Spanish speakers. And that was data from the McNeil lab at the University of Chicago. Um, all groups watched the cartoon Canary Row and narrated it. There was a slight difference in how it was done. The English speakers and Spanish speakers watched the cartoon in its entirety and narrated it to a listener in their language. The Learner watched the cartoon in two segments. So the cartoon has eight episodes. Segment one had four. Segment two also had four. She narrated segment one in the order Spanish-English and segment two in the order English-Spanish. The order was randomly assigned in 1997 and followed again in 2006 and 2011. Um, the episodes were coded using McNeil's coding scheme and path and manner gestures were identified. So what the additional data that I'm talking about today is a detailed analysis of the learner's narration of the remaining six episodes of Canary Row. So it's a total of eight episodes. Two kinds of data were uh, analyzed, speech data, how path was expressed linguistically, so what verbs and satellites were used to indicate path, and speech and gesture data. What motion event speech element the stroke of the path gesture co-occurred with, and whether manner gestures co-occurred with manner and speech or no manner and speech. Let me remind you that Speakers of verb frame languages can have manner gestures with no mention of manner and speech. And speakers of uh, satellite frame languages rarely do that. Okay, so I'm going to show you the native English speaker again and his narration of Sylvester going down the drain pipe and rolling to the bowling alley. And then I'm gonna show you the learner from 1997, 2006, and 2011. Pulls back down the drain pipe, rolls down the street into the bowling alley strike. Okay, so very linear, no separate boundary crossing gesture. Now I want you to pay attention to several things in the L2 learner. In 90, 1997, her gestures are very segmented. There's a, um, practically a gesture for every single grammatical constituent in her sentence. In 2006, her gestures are more fluid, more fluent, and there isn't that kind of segmentation. However, she still has a separate boundary crossing gesture. And the same is true in 2011. Okay, when he came out from the pipe, he went down the bowling place. Yeah, I think he goes all uh, out of the pipe uh -huh. and he goes to the bowling place. Did you see that separate gesture at the end? That's the boundary crossing. 
okay. and go down the bag mm -hmm. all the way to the street and on the with um, on both sides yeah and it just goes directly to the bowling place and then again she has another one in 2011 another boundary crossing gesture so let's take a look at her linguistic expression of path and manner in English. From 2017, there was a change in the expression of path from 1997 to 2006, and it continued to 2011. She consistently used a satellite from 2006 on. There was no change in her expression of manner. She never used the verb roll. She talked about Tweety singing or in a swing, she, and these were accompanied by a manner gesture, but she never used the word swing. Additional data show there's consistent use of the satellite from 2006 on, and there's also an overgeneralization to the path verb enter in 2011, and I will show you this actual data in a moment. The additional data also show that there's use of additional manner verbs, but she never used the verb role. I know this is small, but I hope you can see it. So I have highlighted all the manner verbs and the learner Rosa is compared with the native speakers. So Rosa does use some manner verbs. She uses uses climb, fly, throw, pretty consistently in 97, 2006, and in 2011, she adds the verb walk. Notice in 97, she has three instances of go, not followed by a satellite, but does not have any in the subsequent years. Native English speakers used many more manner verbs, climb, crawl, drop, fall, knock, roll, run, and throw. Now, when we add the additional data, we actually see that Rosa used more manner verbs. In 97, she used drive, jump, run, and she actually began using walk in 97, not in 2011. Those remained the same in 2006, and she added the verb step. In 2011, she added the verb chase, fall, follow to the previous manner verbs. And notice in 2011, she has enter in and enter to. Now in English, we can say we, I entered into an agreement. But that's a very specialized use of the verb enter. When enter is used as a path verb, we say he entered the house. There is no satellite. So this is an overgeneralization. In terms of her expression of path, from 2017, the data showed that path changed. There was a decrease in path gestures with other an increase in path gestures with more than one element, and there was no change in boundary crossing. She followed the Spanish pattern. The additional data show that roughly the same total number of path gestures were produced with a slight increase over the years. So 53 in 97, 54 in 2006, and 57 in 2011. Pattern from STAM 2017 remained the same. So it confirms the pattern that was found in 2017. There were a decrease in path gestures with other, an increase in path gestures with more than one element, and no change in boundary crossing gestures. She followed the Spanish pattern. So just so you have an idea of what her other gestures encompassed, um, here is a chart. In 97, she had 20. In 2006, she had 15. 
in 2011, she had 13, and she had fewer uh, path gestures with pauses, both unfilled and filled pauses in 2011. I'm still in the process of analyzing this in terms of interaction with speech to see how much of this is related to disfluency and word searches. Um, so I do not have that to report to you right now. In terms of manner gestures, remember uh, Spanish speakers may have manner gestures when there's no manner in speech, whereas English speakers rarely have manner gestures when there's no manner in speech. So the 2017 data showed that in 1997, the majority of the learners' manner gestures were with no manner in speech. That was also true for 2006, and it began changing. In 2011, but it did not get to the level of the native English speakers. The additional data show that she still has slightly more manner gestures with no manner in speech in 97 and 2006, but in 2011, she has more gest manner gestures with manner and speech, and it's much more closely approximating the native English speakers. It's not there completely, but it's trending in that direction. Now, I should point out, though, that she still continued to produce more manner-only gestures than path and manner gestures. And I'm not going to read the percentages, you can see that. So what does the additional data tell us? Tells us that linguistically path changed, it, it became more native-like. She consistently used a satellite following a verb from 2006 on. She did have one instance in 2011 of a go not followed by a satellite, but it was a self-correction because the next moment she talked about climbing up. So I, I would say she still consistently used a satellite. Manner changed. She used more manner verbs, but she never used the verb roll. Gestures became less segmented and more English-like. Gesturally also path changed. There was decrease in path gestures with other, an increase in path gestures with more than one element. Manner changed from 2006 to 2011, more in line with the English pattern. She still produced more manner only than path and manner gestures. But boundary crossings did not change. She still followed the Spanish pattern. So what are the findings? The additional data confirmed prior observations, observation of changes in the learner's expression of path and added valuable information about her expression of manner. The learner's L2 pattern of thinking for speaking is still a mixture of L1 and L2. Aspects of L2 patterns of thinking for speaking, path and manner can change. It takes time, but Slobin is also correct. There are elements that are resistant to change, particularly boundary crossings. Findings raise the question of whether linguistic differences in the expression of most events should be taught to learners. And a study has been conducted that tested that. So could concept-based instruction produce changes in thinking for speaking patterns? And this uh, study 
only taught linguistic patterns. Gesture was not taught at all. Gesture was used to assess the patterns of thinking for speaking, and it did show that it's possible. So in conclusion, examining co-speech gestures is essential in determining learners thinking for speaking in their L2 and changes in thinking for speaking. As I mentioned before, appropriate verbal production of motion events descriptions alone does not guarantee that learners are using L2 thinking for speaking patterns. Aspects of learners L2 thinking for speaking path and manner can change. It takes time. It's also important to have as much motion event data as possible and to have stimuli that elicit motion event descriptions. Boundary crossings are more resistant to change, but the study by Stam et al. also shows that they can change with explicit instruction in linguistic thinking for speaking patterns. L2 linguistic thinking for speaking patterns can and should be taught. Gestures and speech together reveal how learners are really thinking about motion. Thank you.